this computer. All right, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our webinar today with uh, Lisa Edgar. She's really, 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 um, well, actually we're really, really grateful that she's been able to come along and uh, do this uh, webinar for us. Um, she'll be answering some of the questions that you guys have put through, uh, through um, our social media outlets. And so if you aren't subscribed to our Facebook groups, uh, then please do so. Uh, we can have the link sent out or at the end of this uh, presentation, or if you have any uh, questions about uh, linking up for our Facebook groups, then kind of just uh, put it up in the chat and we can put a link through there as well. Um, and so without further ado, we'll hand our time over to Lisa Edgar, who is one of the lead pharmacists, or actually the medicines management pharmacist at Auckland DHB. Uh, awesome, over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Tim. So um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay, um, but Tim and I have been discussing a potential, uh, well, we've been hoping to have an opportunity to speak to everyone here. Um, originally, it was meant to be um, in, in uh, one of the sessions, you know, the weekly sessions that you have. But of course, in the light of the current situation that we're facing, we thought a webinar would be the best way forward. Um, we've also tweaked the topic a little bit and it's been um, slightly changed to the supply of funded medicines in New Zealand um, and putting in line with the COVID-19 situation, which I'm sure many of you are quite interested to hear about. Um, okay, so I guess to start, I should probably introduce myself a little bit. So Tim mentioned my name is Lisa Edgar, and I am currently the lead pharmacist and medicines management here in Auckland um, DHB. I'm based in Auckland Hospital, um, and my role um, overseas and um, I guess looks after um, Auckland Hospital Starship and Green Lane. Um, so I guess my job very briefly, I manage the supply of medicine um, and liaise with Pharmac um, and on how to implement their rules essentially. Um, I work a lot with Pharmac and I represent, I guess, Pharmac and their um, instructions to the rest of the ADHB to make sure that um, we comply and that we um, do our best to act um, consistently with all the other DHBs um, in the country. So I come from a community background. Um, I actually trained as a community pharmacist all the way through um, and then uh, for about six years. And then I went abroad to the UK and I came back to this opportunity here today. So hopefully um, today we'll give you a little bit of insight on what um, I do and also how I can share my experience with you. Oops, let's go back. So to start, I thought we'll go through and um, just bullet point some of the things that we're going to be covering today. Um, a lot of that I, I appreciate might be already known to you, um, and but for those that are unfamiliar, I'm just going to brush through it briefly and I can always um, answer questions about the presentation a bit later on. So hey, we'll talk about Pharmac. Yes? Um, just, it, there's, a, there's a section that says please move this window oh. away from the shared application. Um, okay. I just wonder, is it, is it easier if I, because I know sometimes in the hospital there might be like some security things. So uh, if I if I bring up the presentation on my side and get you to do it from that way, would that be okay? Yeah. Can I still click through though? Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll make sure that you click through. So oh, okay. That's fine. You do that and we can um, just jump to this page. You go for it. Cool. Um, cool. You can see that. Uh, uh, yes, I can. There you go, and I will give you, there you go, you should have the remote control now. Cool, so I will just go into slideshow. Cool. I'm not liking me. Is it happening on your end? Uh, nope, there you go. It's just a little bit slow on my end. Um, it's still showing as the normal slide. It's full. It's full screen now on our oh. side. Oh, okay. That's the case. So if I click that, that just changed. Yeah, yeah. Hold on one second. Let me just see if I can. Um, if I do this. Oh, okay. And then you do it. Then I, yes, much better. All right. Let me just test it out. Does that work if I click? Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. does. Okay, perfect. Cool. Oh, gone a bit too far. So that's fine. Let's go back to this page. All so right. just to outline, 
We will, what did I say? Okay, um, I'll start off with talking about Pharmac very briefly um, for those that are not as familiar as I am. Oh, it's still moving. Um, there we go. Then um, we'll move on to national medicine supply um, and the process that takes place um, and some of the things that you may not be aware of um, that happens behind the scene. Um, what happens when supply disruptions happen, which I'm sure you're very eager to know about, um, and responding to supply issues, what Pharmac does and how everyone partakes in these issues. Um, and then lastly, um, I thought I will apply it more to a community level and talk about how um, it affects the patient and the link um, and the process that takes place. Um, I will then end with some online resources for you to take away and have a look at and um, we'll go through the questions that were sent through earlier this week. All right, so click. Does that work? Here we go. So Pharmac, um, Apologies if I'm repeating these to people that know, but Pharmac's um, Pharmaceutical Management Agency is better known as Pharmac. It is a New Zealand government agency um, and it decides on what medicine and um, how medicines are funded in New Zealand. Pharmac reports to the Ministry of Health. Um, they are one of, um, one of their main goals that was designated by them is to get the most out of um, all the allocated budget that's been given to them. Um, Pharmac manages budgets by implementing the pharmaceutical schedule, which I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with. And um, if not, the schedule is basically a list of medicine that can be used um, and subsidized by the government and is to provide to patients in the use in the community and in public hospitals. So with that in mind, specifically to national medicine supply, um, one of Pharmac's strategies that they put in place is to sign contracts with pharmaceutical companies. Um, they do this through quite a detailed tendering process, um, and it happens, and I see it quite often in my role, where they will find the most competitive price for the New Zealand market of a specific um, drug as such. Um, when a pharmaceutical company has essentially won the tender, um, they are given the sole supplier contract or a status, they call it. Um, and this allows the supplier, so the pharmaceutical company, to know that they can supply to the New Zealand market of this product with very minimal competition. Um, as a result, it's, it's a two-way relationship, Pharma asks that these um, pharmaceutical companies for this specific drug that they've won the tender for um, ensure ongoing supply. So they do this in two levels, and um, it's common knowledge. Um, it's, it's not anything that's, um, and it's actually written down in, on the Pharmac website as well. But one is that um, companies are to notify Pharmac when stock levels are below a certain level. I put in bracket two months because that is variable. Um, sometimes it could be more or less. Um, and the other way is that some suppliers, um, so pharmaceutical companies, will need to cover the cost of a replacement product if, say, they are no longer able to supply within the period that their contract lasts for. So while these supplier contracts or pharmaceutical contracts with um, a government agency like Pharmac is almost not seen around the world at all, it's, it's not common internationally um, whatsoever, it's very much in New Zealand and it's um, working in New Zealand as well. Um, it is a contributing factor for the pharmaceutical companies to really take ownership and they take responsibility um, to maintain these supply and be part of the contingency plan as such. So supply disruptions, um, I guess, you know, what I want to point out here is that there's going to be factors and disruptions do happen. Manufacturing delays, um, disruptions, regulatory changes, which is probably more common. You get uh, product recalls um, and, and, and such, we get epidemics and pandemic, um, it can occur and it does take the market by surprise. In these circumstances, Pharmac would immediately work closely with all the parties involved and take um, a lead on the contingency plan that's involved. Um, I'll go into more detail about this later on because it does take a few th um, slides to explain. But I guess what's important to note in this slide itself is that um, the supply and demand balance that is um, seen in this infographic, it does shift and it happens quite often. Um, not many times it gets to the patient level, but um, it does need a lot of monitoring by Pharmac um, and communication with everyone else. Um, I guess, as you can imagine, what happens when we're faced with um, a pandemic, global pandemic, COVID-19, is that these impacts are going to be 
bigger ripples. Um, it, it's going to have some major disruptions on, um, I guess, the supply or the manufacturing of medicine. And that is, I guess, a concern that you will all have and it's something that very much is in the front of Pharmac's um, attention. But I guess what I have to say is that like any other disruption, um, we have to face it, the same mechanism and, and the process that's been put in place. And so um, what Pharmac often does, and this is something also on their website, is um, they have a number of strategies that they can do to make sure we, get, we don't get to the uh, patient level of impact. So responding to supply issues, um, just to name a few, um, Pharmac would suspend, if a product is under sole supply, one of the strategies that they can do is to suspend sole supply contracts. Um, so that's the ones that I was referring to earlier. And the reason why they do that is so that they can bring in other medicine or they can look into alternatives. So the contract just basically stops or puts on hold. Um, sometimes you might even see the supplier themselves if they can't bring in that drug identify another product um, that they have and they do that willingly because of course they don't want to be faced with the cost implications that could happen if they have to pay back the difference. Um, another thing is that they work with um, suppliers to find alternative stock. Most times being New Zealand being an island country and we don't manufacture a lot of uh, drugs here, the overseas alternatives is the option we take. And um, that happens um, quite regularly um, where, I guess, a New Zealand registered product, even though that's preferred, at times will go out of stock and another one can't be identified. And if that's the case, they will find an unregistered one. Um, what unregistered mean, and I just want to make really clear, is not that it's an inferior or unsafe or any sorts of um, product. It just simply means it hasn't gone through that New Zealand regulatory system, which is led by MedSafe New Zealand, um, and it's not kind of gone through that process to give it the New Zealand registered, um, I guess, status. Um, often you'll see that the product that is identified or brought in, um, even though it's unregistered, it actually is licensed abroad um, in America and the UK um, in Australia, so and it's used commonly there. Um, I guess to put into some context is like, for example, you know, paracetamol. Um, everyone knows Panadol. Um, it, it's a very household name here in New Zealand. Um, say Panadol went out of stock, which is probably not a nice thing to know, but say if it did, the brand itself went out of stock. Um, Pharmac will then go and identify a, another product, say Ethics Paracetamol or a, another brand from the UK on the US. Um, the drug is the same. It's not registered in New Zealand, but it's equivalent and it's safe to use. Um, further stock management tools that um, is another way that Pharmac will respond to these supply issues and um, I appreciate that it's just a broad terminology but um, I'll, I'll follow up with a few examples. Um, I guess what Pharmac does is that they can restrict and that's one of their management um, tools the dispensing or the supply of medicine um, to, to a less freak, uh, I guess a more frequent lesser quantity amount. Um, we actually saw this tool being utilized very recently in the COVID-19 situation where um, Ashley Broomfield um, and the Ministry of Health and Pharma Act decided to restrict all community pharmaceutical um, uh, prescriptions to one month dispensing. Um, it doesn't mean that we're running out in the country, it just means that the supply and demand balance has been, I guess, shifted um, and that the, um, they needed a little bit more time and stretch out the demand so that the supply can catch up. Um, another way that they have done this in the past is with the uh, Ministry of Health flu vaccines. So I guess we saw that in the recent flu vaccine campaign, which I'm hoping most of you are aware of, um, is that we had really, really extraordinary quick uptake of flu vaccines um, as a country. That's expected. Um, I guess what was unexpected it was how quick it was going to be in terms of the next shipment that was due to come in. And so the Ministry of Health knew this was happening, Pharmac knew it was happening, and together they um, started some allocation process where the supplier or the wholesalers were only able to supply a certain amount of um, medicine to the users. So DHBs were only able to give in a certain amount at a time. Um, and also they ask alongside that allocation, they ask all DHBs and um, pharmacies and GPs that were giving out these vaccines to only give it for priority patients. Um, and as it stands today, I believe this is still the case. And up until 27th of April, 
all private sale or non-funded flu vaccines um, will have to wait and um, the priority patients will get it first. Um, so I guess what I want to get to on this slide is that these strategies are done as one big team. Um, there's a lot of consulting and you'll see me throw that word around a lot um, and that happens with wholesalers and pharmacists. Um, it is led by Pharmac and Ministry of Health, I guess, um, eventually and, um, or, or sorry, not eventually, that's the wrong word, it's more like Ministry of Health as more the guidance it needs to. Um, and often that will also go to the physician side because at times there will be long-term stock shortages where um, a product might be discontinued or um, it's just no longer being um, available in New Zealand and decide to, to pull that into New Zealand or not make it. And if that is the case, then um, we always recommend you to seek clinical advice and go back to your GP or your hematologist and they will provide the information you need to find an alternative. Um, they will be aware when these happen because it does, um, Pharmac, as you mentioned earlier, gives a lot of notice and um, suppliers are obligated to give it plenty of notice to um, Pharmac so that chain will fall, um, will, will fall through and hopefully it will allow a little bit more headway, uh, so heads up for them to know how to find an alternative. So in this next slide, I just wanted to, um, you, I guess, put into visuals of what um, I talked about before. I whipped it up really quickly. So apologies if things are not lined up nicely. Um, but I guess with the understanding of the different process that Farmag Farm, Farm adopts, um, I wanted to provide some assurance and just kind of put in front and put yourself in that scenario um, of how that might um, affect you in the chain of the process. So um, it starts with the patient, of course. Um, then the doctor gives the patient prescription. The patient goes to their local pharmacy. Um, say their local pharmacy um, doesn't have enough stock or, or is, is looking at the stock um, and the wholesaler is aware, um, then it goes to Pharmac. Often, Pharmac will be aware as well, but we'll get to that stage later. Um, but looking at this presentation itself, what I wanted to just note here is that community pharmacies, um, they act independently. Um, you know, there's many community pharmacies out there, um, and they manage their stock and inventory completely differently as well. Um, it just means when they're independent that they cannot see what other pharmacies down the road hold on their shelves and what they have in stock. Um, so with that in mind, I guess, what we need to know is that it's so important that these community pharmacies work with the wholesalers um, to make sure that they liaise and they link um, with the, the stock maintenance or the supply and logistic issues all the way through and they put it together as one national supply to report to um, Pharmac. Um, they, they are, I guess, placed in a really unique position, these wholesalers, um, because they um, will have the eyes and ears of the market um, and they really are vital to provide and monitor stock demands um, so that the supply and this demand balance is um, ongoing. So I wanted to just then take it to the next level and assure you that even though what you see is that initial, I guess, five steps, um, what happens behind the scene is um, can be a lot more detailed as well. Um, I use these speech bubbles um, to kind of symbolize discussions or collaborations, consultations. Um, it happens quite frequently and that's why we need a lot of time um, when these uh, supply disruptions happen. So pharmaceutical companies um, will get involved in the way that they will notify Pharmac that there's a shortage. Pharmac and Ministry of Health work together um, and they will figure out exactly what needs to be done, um, what the impact is, and then at times um, the Ministry of Health will then report to the physician um, and notify them if needs to, and the physicians can often be back as well. What's quite good here is, um, and I, you know, for those that might see, I always put double-ended arrows on, on this diagram just because it's nice to know that it, it is a two-way relationship. It's not just an instruction decided by Pharmac all the way up the top. It, they do listen to the clinician's um, advice, the patient's concern, and um, feedback that way. Um, I guess a few additional points to make here um, is that, you know, as community pharmacies are independent, as I said before, um, at times one community pharmacy might exhaust their stock and another might still have plenty of it on their shelves. Um, so it's actually worth bringing ahead, especially in times like this where you don't want to be going out of your homes on a you know, daily basis um, if you don't have to and ask whether a prescription can be filled and whether they do home deliveries as well and contactless deliveries. Um, 
there's there's also going to be times where, um, and I mentioned earlier, and I should probably put another circle here, but I didn't. But um, but when a stock is being discontinued or there's a long-term shortage, that means that you're going to run out of medicine. Um, and if that is the case, then um, luckily, Ministry of Health or uh, Medical Council or all the other um, organisations will involve the uh, prescribers and they should have a lot of um, knowledge and um, information to know exactly what needs to be done to make sure that you receive the best treatment possible moving forward with a possible alternative medicine. Um, bear in mind, an alternative might be a different brand, um, like the paracetamol example I gave earlier. It could be a different formulation, liquid, tablet, instead of infusion, etc., or it could be a, a different medicine altogether. So this is the final slide um, in my very short presentation, but I just wanted to talk about what you can do. So um, I actually just got this straight from the Pharmac website, um, and it's something that just bullet points some I guess quite common sense instructions to a lot of you, but it's quite nice to capture. Um, Pharmac always says, you know, one to two weeks worth of your medication is sufficient. Um, this allows you to, to um, I guess, have enough assurance, but also give you the time if you need to for the pharmacy to order some more stock in, if it's a simple delay because of that reason. Um, you should always phone ahead, like I said before, um, because, you know, you don't want to be, uh, or, or ask about contact like, contactless delivery um, and it's nice to know that a lot of pharmacies out there are doing this kind of service um, it's also protecting them as well and so the pharmacists are very keen to make sure their patients are protected and the assurance and that everyone is safe um, I guess if a shortage is longer um, than the usual then you want to speak to your doctor and your pharmacist um, earlier to find the alternative um, sometimes the pharmacist um, if it's a short-term inquiry, and I know that I did that from experience, I did that as well in the past when I had my role, is that I, I would just ring my local go-to pharmacist down the road and ask them if they have stock. Um, it's a good relationship that we usually have with the nearest pharmacy. And at the end of the day, we just want to make sure we're looking out for our patients uh, and it's causing less stress as possible in these difficult times. Um, if you can't, uh, do not stockpile. I think that's one of the key points that um, the Ministry of Health put through um, in, in a lot of the uh, messages that's come from the initial uh, lockdown period. Um, it's just making it harder for us from a supply chain purpose to see what the trend is because when stockpile happens, it just disrupts everything and we can't forecast what the country needs um, in a normal level. So to end this presentation, I wanted to end with some online resources. Um, these are hyperlinks. So I'll, I'll, Tim's already got a copy of um, my presentation, but he can um, forward it all to you if needs to, and you can just have a look at these links. Uh, Pharmac is a fantastic resource. Um, I do find them really helpful in the sense that they explain things well um, on their website. Um, the website can be a little bit hard to navigate, but go straight to the patient information section, um, and they also have a link for specifically for COVID-19, which I recommend. Um, but, you know, if you get the chance to have a read on the rationale of why they do these things, what all the processes that I discussed, but probably in more detail, and um, hopefully you can provide a little bit more assurance on how they, um, what they do behind the scene to mitigate these risks for everyone. So, to end, oh, some questions. Um, so last week, um, Tim kindly sent through some questions. I know there's a few that's popped up today, but for those that may have joined a bit later on the presentation, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, I guess my role itself, I, I'm, um, it'd be nice to have a little bit more preparation with some of the questions, um, and this is why I've asked them to do so, so that I can make sure the right answers are given. Sometimes it might involve a hematology pharmacist um, to, to have their input. Um, and with the questions coming up, um, that's exactly what I've done. So hopefully it'll be a little bit more complete. But I guess before we start, um, some of the questions I've noticed is very specific. Um, and so I, it's more of a disclaimer just to say that there's obviously a number of factors that happens to every patient situation. And for me to be able to fully understand and answer the question, I might need to know these factors. So my answers could come across a little bit general. Um, and if you need further like, detailed, um, advice you have to speak to your doctor or your pharmacist um, who will know your situation and hopefully provide that for you um, okay so there we go 
First question, I'll read it out first. With the new generation of drugs becoming available, will, these, will those on imatinib like myself change? Three months ago, blood shows major molecular remission and I do not need to see hematologists until September. However, I'm still having three monthly blood tests and remain on the medication daily. So my answer to that um, is that it's unlikely that you will change from imatinib um, unless you actually have side effects shown. Imatinib itself is a fantastic, it's a great medicine. Um, if you are in molecular remission, like, like you said, um, then it's showing that it's actually working really well for you. Um, I would advise to continue with your three monthly blood test. Um, it does get monitored and sent through to your physician to, to look at. Um, and hopefully your next visit is in September and um, that uh, not too soon and, you know, um, and good luck, I guess. Um, the next question that came through is, hi, I still have Lovia 400, which is an antiviral for when I had acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, and stem cell transplant back in 2016. Is it okay to take that during the winter? Um, technically, my immune system is stable, but I know I still get cold and that goes to my chest and cold sores. Um, is there any use against COVID-19? So Lovia or um, Acyclovir um, will only prevent um, herpes simplex virus. And unfortunately, it's not protective against um, COVID-19, any rhinovirus or respiratory viruses that can cause uh, colds or influenza. Um, I, I wouldn't advise um, using an old medication um, from a previous treatment. It's, to be honest, probably expired now. by now if it's um, from 2016. And um, I would advise just going, taking it back to your local pharmacy if you get the chance to, and getting them to dispose it. Um, it's, it's important, however, in this question, I'm glad you raised it during winter months um, to get your flu vaccine. Um, as I mentioned earlier on the presentation, the 2020 flu vaccine is available um, and it's currently prioritised for eligible patients and frontline healthcare staff. Um, the vaccine can be available free of charge from your GP. Um, I know pharmacies are also giving it and in the hospital when you're coming in for your appointment, if you come in, um, the hospitals will also give it to you as well. Um, definitely consider that if you haven't done already, um, because the last thing we want is for somebody that unfortunately are infected with both any complication with the flu as well as COVID-19, and that's not what we want. So, after chemo um, and or radiation, what vitamins can help restore health and well-being? Um, after chemo, there's no supplements that have any proven benefits or, or can be proven to be beneficial. Um, I guess the best advice, and I apologize, it is a general advice, is to eat a healthy diet, get some gentle exercise, and um, as fatigue allows. Um, I, I just want to point out here that pharmacists, we practice evidence-based medicine, um, and by and large, I guess, complementary and alternative medicine, um, they don't have an adequate um, evidence to support it. And the concern there is that um, they don't regulate it the way that pharmaceutical medicine that we take or prescribe from a doctor are. Um, this lack, lack of medicine, or sorry, this lack of evidence, um, it, it doesn't tell pharmacists on how it works, if they work, um, and how they affect the body and, and interact with other medicine. And that is a concern. So of course, um, I guess, you know, Exceptions to uh, there's some exceptions to um, true vitamins such as vitamin D, magnesium, and so forth that are really quite beneficial for people that are deficient. But as a blanket statement for vitamins in general, um, it's something that um, we don't have that much support in bringing, um, I guess, evidence and, and uh, advice to you. So, in that uh, question, I wanted to, there's a follow up, and that's why I placed this question quite strategically afterwards and talks about interactions between vitamins and treatment medicine. Um, and I touched on that briefly, but I guess I appreciate that many cancer patients will access alternative therapy, homeopathy, um, naturopaths, and that's expected. Um, it is, however, important to let your pharmacists and your doctors know. For the exact reasons I mentioned earlier, we want to know that if we do have resources available, what can we do to help you? And what can we do to look up to make sure that it is completely safe? Um, I actually consulted our medicines information um, department and they gave me a really good reference that you're welcome to have a look um, and afterwards and click on the link below. It's an American Institute, um, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Kettering Cancer Center website. It does have some vitamins um, and alternative um, medicine 
in their search bar. Um, but I guess bear in mind it is um, limited for the New Zealand population because it is from the US. It's publicly available, it's patient friendly. Um, so that would be one that we would say, if you're really interested, have a look. Next question, um, the exact question is that Rob Weinkoff spoke about vitamin D being helpful in respiratory conditions. Where can we buy these and what is the best dosage for blood cancer patients? Um, Unfortunately, I, um, I, I'm sh both the hematology pharmacist and I not exactly aware of what Rob was referring to. Um, it's hard to say, but I, I guess what we can go on to, to say is that there is a BMJ meta-analysis published in around 2017 that showed that vitamin D supplement was safe and it's protected against acute respiratory tract infections overall. Um, patients that were very deficient in vitamin D um, and those not receiving, uh, I guess, bulk doses found it the most beneficial. Um, the meta-analysis, which is a combination of different studies, um, looked at as one piece of work. Um, it looked at about 25 different studies, and it was shown that there was no one standard dose uh, for all 25 studies. So not much of an answer there, I apologize. Um, but I, I guess, you know, if you want to know about exactly what Rob was referring to, maybe Tim can follow up with him if that was a previous presentation. Um, I appreciate you might not have access to him directly, but um, if that's not the case, speak to your doctor um, and talk about the different strengths of vitamin D out there. Um, and they, I'm sure, will make some recommendations to you for you as well, specifically. Um, next page. Can we have some reassurance regarding the supply of our medicine? So I hope the brief webinar before gave you a little bit of reassurance. Um, I guess, just to kind of recap, as you can imagine, there's a lot of work done by um, every DHB. Uh, it's done on a regional level as well as nationally. Um, and our main goal is to support and make sure that the supply of medicine um, in these uncertain times are maintained. Um, we do, however, anticipate that there will be disruptions and we will be challenged. Um, that is inevitable. But there are mechanisms that we have put in place, and I hope that um, the previous presentation gives you a little bit of um, knowledge of what exactly is happening behind the scene. Um, we will do our absolute best to make sure we find alternatives. Um, sometimes they may not be identical, um, or sometimes they are, but just different brand. So if that is the case, then um, I guess rest assured that prescribers are very much aware that this could be an upcoming issue. Uh, Pharmac talked about how they're foreseeing this issue to be until the end of 2020, um, but we are doing everything we can to make sure we give everyone as much notice as possible. Once again, if you get the chance to ring your community pharmacy ahead, make sure that they have and are able to fill your prescription. And if they're not, ask them, have a conversation and ask why that's the case and if they can advise you to go somewhere else or uh, wait a, a week or so. Um, Next question, my hematologist changed my medication to oral due to the lockdown. Does this mean that I'm worse off now? Um, your hematologist is balancing the risk and benefit that's happening um, during the crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there is a risk of catching, of course, um, COVID-19 if you come into a hospital, if you go anywhere um, outside of your bubble. Um, and our goal is to make sure we keep everyone safe um, and, you know, there's certain medicines out there, such as um, thil sorry, uh, thalidomide, lenalidomide, um, that's very active against multiple myeloma. And just because the medicine is an oral form um, doesn't mean that it's less effective. In fact, I would say that with a lot of cancer drugs that's coming through at the moment, we are seeing more oral forms um, being made and formulated. Um, I feel like that, that obviously so that it can be more patient friendly. Um, it's easier for patients to take. They don't have to come to hospital and receive infusions. And that might be the trend we're seeing moving forward. Um, second to last one, regarding the new scheme for rituximab, there's now a generic version that's being funded, but potentially some are not being started on this due to COVID-19. Great question. Um, rituximab is a biosimilar medicine. And what biosimilar means is that it's a the drug itself is like a living organism, which um, has very small variations when it's, I guess, copied or um, into different um, forms. Um, studies that compare Rixineo, which is the generic or generic brand as such, referred to here in this question, with the original brand, Mavthera, um, shows that, um, that they're 
very, very similar. They're highly similar. Um, and that the active substance um, itself is doing and should be treated exactly the same way in patients. So irrespective of brand, there will be no difference on how rituximab is used in, in the treatment. Um, so I guess the second part to your question is that, um, oh, sorry, let me just get rid of that. Um, the second part to your question is that um, the Minister of Health, um, I guess, uh, there was a statement that was released. Uh, Ministry of Health Cancer Control Agency uh, released a statement to ensure that there is national consistency in cancer and blood services during the COVID-19 um, lockdown and any sorts of immediate time ahead. The priority is to continue service to patients um, and making sure they're receiving the best possible treatment, but also balancing the risk of coming into a hospital. The risk is not only just for patients, also for the staff as well, of course. Um, so specifically to rituximab, um, the, the statement actually go on to say that they advise to defer rituximab maintenance treatment and low-grade B-cell lymphoma for the current time. Um, this was in reference to the level four, of course. Um, and I also want to say it's not a blanket statement for every single patient that's on rituximab. Um, it will be considered on a case-by-case basis. Um, and with level three uh, coming up next week, um, I'm sure all this will be reassessed and readdressed again. So if you're unsure, have a chat with your physician and they will be in touch. Very last question. What is the general process for medication funding? And can I help the medicine that I need to get through Pharmac faster? Um, that's a great question. Um, it's definitely one that I can answer, but um, it might take a little bit longer than usual to answer. In fact, ironically, this was the topic that um, Tim and I were going to um, discuss um, and present to you initially before um, if all this COVID-19 um, uh, happened. So I'll break up the questions a little bit so I can be a bit more thorough. Um, in the Pharmac web on the Pharmac website, there is a really great um, infographic, which I've just PDF'd and linked here because um, Zoom doesn't like links, apparently. Um, there's a, this infographic details the step-by-step -step process and the journey of the funding application that it goes through. Um, I don't have the time to go through every step um, today, but a few things I want to point out is that one, anyone can make a funding application. Um, we've seen applications from pharmaceutical companies, from patients, doctors, pharmacists. We've seen it from Pharmac themselves. Um, does not discriminate. Um, Pharmac does adopt uh, what they call factors for consideration. And this is seen in this little colorful symbol here. Um, further details will be given on the website. But what that means is that it's a framework that they use at every nearly every single step of the way um, to make sure that they consider the need for the patient, the benefit that it causes, the cost and saving as a country and the cohort, and the suitability of the medicine's impact on health outcomes. With that in mind, um, they hope that they can come up with a consistent um, result for every single application that comes through and um, look after all of New Zealanders um, as, a, as a whole. Um, the second part to your question, you talk about how um, I'll go back here. Um, why are some cancer drugs seem to be pushed through really quickly, um, like venetoclax and um, uh, what was the other example that you gave before lenalidomide? So before medicine can be marketed into New Zealand, it must be registered with MedSafe, um, which is a medicine regulatory body. It's all the way here before we even start. Um, it usually requires the, um, the medication to be registered and, and that there's a whole assessment in, in itself. Um, however, pharma has made an exception for cancer drugs. So cancer medicine itself does not need to go through MedSafe. It can be unregistered. Uh, bear in mind that, that I mentioned before, unregistered does not mean un, unsafe or, un, um, or inferior. Um, it also doesn't guarantee that it will go through the application process or it's prioritized over any other non-cancer treatment. Um, it means that the funding assessment process will start sooner. Um, and that might be a reason why you see it kind of popping up um, throughout the process. On that note as well, there's a lot of um, studies and there's a lot of research that's been put into cancer treatment, uh, as you can probably expect. And we're seeing a lot of that come through. Um, and that could be another reason why um, Pharmax is very eager to make sure that they look after their, their patient groups in New Zealand. Last question you had was, how can I help? So one of the final stages of the funding process um, in, these, in this infographic 
is, I'll see if this works, ah, oh, here we go, um, includes the consultation of their funding proposal. Um, the consultation can be found on the FarmAct website and it's under notifications and it pops up every once in a while. Um, you can subscribe to FarmAct and they will email you directly as well. Um, I know I do, <laughs> I get it all the time. Um, so anyone that has interest in a particular consultation or proposal to fund a drug can write to Pharmac. They can write in a letter form and all the information is given under the proposal and you can submit it directly to them and um, tell them you know, that, that you need it um, and how you feel towards it. Um, I write to Pharmac on behalf of ADHB um, from a, I guess, evidence-based perspective. Being a pharmacist, we consult our services as well. So um, it's always a combined effort that we do. And um, often we do see these proposals being successful, which is really exciting to see. And um, it's, it's, it's very well received by our patients. So that's all from me today. Um, I feel like I've talked a lot and thank you everyone for your time. Tim, if you want to unmute, you're more than welcome to um, see if we can go through some of the questions, if I can. If not, we can always follow up. Cool. All right. Well, first of all, on behalf of everyone that's tuned in, uh, that your presentation was really, really, really informative, not only for them, but for myself as well, uh, in terms of I feel kind of really calm that Pharmac and everyone in the pharmaceutical industry ha will have enough medicines for everyone. Um, and that's, that's really, 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 so I think you talked about the vaccines. Um, someone yes. here has talked about the unavailabil unavailability of the pneumococcal vaccine. Um, is, there, is there any update on that? So I might need to know a little bit more specific which pneumococcal vaccine they're referring to. Um, there's a few different uh, vaccines that have combination of different strains. So um, as much as I want to answer that question, um, mm -hmm. maybe I might need a little bit more information to follow up and I'll recommend just emailing. Oh, there we go. We're live. That's great. So yeah, um, you can follow up with um, the actual brand if that is the case and I can mm -hmm. um, provide a little bit more. I, I guess I, from my end, um, I see all the stock shortages that happen from ADHD perspective. I don't know exactly what happens in the community. Um, and like I said, it's variable depending on the community pharmacy as well. But as a whole, um, when there's shortages, um, it's very unlikely it will just be unavailable full stop. It could be very much that another brand needs to come in instead. So with the likes of this pneumococcal vaccine, it very much could be the case. So um, yeah, with a little bit more detail, I can probably provide a bit better answer to that. Cool. Um, so whoever asked that question, if you can kind of email us uh, directly, that would be awesome. Um, someone talked about a supply problem with anagrylide. Anagrylide, yeah, yep. in Northland. Yep. That happened, uh, I believe the supply issue happened last year. Um, I, I, I was notified in the community, um, and I have to admit we were late to the party because it didn't really affect the DHB as such. Um, but I did hear about it from a couple of our Northland and Auckland pharmacies. Um, it, Pharmac was, it was escalated up to Pharmac and I believe um, there was a generic, or sorry, I, I shouldn't say generic, a, a section 29 or unregistered medicine that was made available um, to, to patients and that's been brought in. Um, I might need to touch base and see exactly what's been happened, what has happened since then, but to my understanding, the uh, unregistered medicine uh, was, was sufficient to, to distribute to the pharmacy. Um, if it's, I don't think it's a Northland region as such, it could be that specific pharmacy. And if that's the case, um, maybe you can try uh, bring ahead or another pharmacy down the road. I know that our community pharmacy in level five um, do keep an agrolide a lot and they have plenty of stock. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Lyle uh, asked, how long will this monthly dispensing last for? Oh, I wish I knew. <laughs> um, Pharma has released a statement on their website that says they, they foresee this challenge and the impact of COVID-19 till the end of 20, uh, 2020. Um, I, I don't, oops, apologies. I don't want to um, speculate, but I, I feel like it will take a little while for the disruptions to kind of, for us to see the full impact and also see the disruptions, um, uh, I guess, settle down. So I would say for a little while, monthly dispensing is absolutely fine. Um, I know it might be inconvenient for some patients to have to go in or they might live in a, um, 
a, I guess, a less, uh, in the rural area, they have to drive a bit to get into their local pharmacy. But um, like I said, there are ways around that. Uh, pharmacies do deliveries and they also allow, um, I know some pharmacies will also post um, or, or courier your medicine to you if you're really stuck. So um, for a little while is the answer to that, but I don't know. <laughs> cool, all right, thanks so much. Um, Bruce asked, who decides what the tablets cost? And I think you went through that in your last question, eh? Yeah, so it's a combined effort. Of course, the suppliers, just like any uh, like supply chain from, from supermarket items to any retail item, they have a cost. They, they have a, a price point um, to their drug. Um, and they would have that set and they will probably present it to Pharmac. Pharmac will probably say, what's the best you can do? And then they will negotiate them down. That is Pharmac's, uh, one of their primary goals, and they are very good at it. They, um, they use a lot of their strategies that I mentioned in my first slide about um, giving them less competition and allowing them to have, um, I guess, that sole supply status. And as a result, you will see that what the New Zealand market pays is substantially less than what is in the US, um, especially the US, but um, around the world. And that's because of Pharmac. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, uh, and an anonymous person asks, who decides what medical conditions are eligible for free treatment? Is that, mm, I feel like that question is more to do with what is a funded treatment? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it as that. Um, as I guess to rephrase that question, I, ho I hope I'm kind of saying what the person's wanting to know about is mm. what restrictions are under um, uh, what restrictions are, are, are under a particular drug for funding as opposed to that you don't need funding treatment, and that is Pharmac again. However, Pharmac. They're not made up of a bunch of doctors. They're, they're, a lot of them are pharmacists. Um, a lot of them are operations managers. They consult with a clinical body. Um, in that very last slide, um, Tim, do you still have my um, mm -hmm. presentation? Cool. Would you like me so, to bring that back up? Yeah, the very last slide with the um, infographic. So um, the PDF. This one? That's it. Sorry, I just yeah, took over your screen. Uh, hopefully that's working or not. Oh, there you Not, go. Cool. So that, that very last, yeah, that's the one. Um, and that very last slide, you might see here this one, PTAC. And then there's discussions, there's lots of PTAC, there's clinical decisions, and uh, here we go. So everything that you see with people sitting in, around a table basically um, is their way of saying that they consult with subcommittees, committees um, made up of doctors, some of them your doctors, you, um, you know, and the hematologists that work at Auckland Hospital. I know um, many of them will sit on these committees and they will advise to Pharmac and together they will make a recommendation using the factors of consideration that Pharmac um, has, has made um, and make a decision of what they recommend. Ultimately the decision is still down to the PTAC committee and Pharmac and they will make um, and then that then will go out on consultation which is why I circled um, and everyone who wants to can write to them and then they'll make a final decision. All right sweet. Um, and our last question, which is a long one, is can you comment on the, uh, I think you have, but can you comment on the state of implementation of the recent Pharmac decision to fund rituximab as maintenance treatment for follicular lymphoma from March 1st? Mm. Um, obviously, there was a question that talked about it was halted due to, to lockdown, but for those with a more aggressive follicular, lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, they cannot afford to wait. So with uh, COVID-19 under better control, it seems that the reasons for treatment outweigh the threat of COVID-19. My understanding is that there were exceptions to that statement. Um, I didn't read, I, I, I do have a copy of that statement, which I obviously can't share, but um, I, I'm aware that they um, did make a few exceptions to that statement where very much the case where treatment cannot wait and that the treatment outweighs the threat um, or the potential threat of um, COVID-19 by coming to hospital. Mm. I feel like the answer to that is very much just have a discussion with your doctor. Um, they are under strict instructions from the Ministry of Health. And like I said, um, everyone at the moment um, are on quite high alert to make sure that our patients um, are well looked after. So if you're really concerned, express your concern and let them know and they will present to you the evidence and why they've made that decision. And if um, there is an exception in, in your condition. Awesome. 
Thank you so much. That's all our questions that we have for today. And um, thank you so much for answering all of them. No um, problem. It's been amazing. It's been amazing having you along. And I'm sure um, if everyone was able to give you a um, high five or um, Spiritual applause, high five. <laughs> <laughs> then yeah. they would. Uh, so on behalf of Leukemia and Blood Cancer New Zealand, we'd like to thank you for um, reaching out to our patients today. Uh, we're truly and very much grateful for uh, your time and um, your preparation and doing this webinar. So thank you so much, Lisa. Not a problem at all. It's my absolute pleasure. Definitely. And someone said applause in the, <laughs> <laughs> in the comments. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone else for, for tuning in as well. Um, and hope to see you at our next webinar. Thanks, Lisa. Thank Take care. Bye. Bye.